Hi guys, today we're going to be discussing Crescent City, House of Earth and Blood. So today with me I have my best friend Stephanie, who Hello. I buddy read this book with. Yes. I did vlog my reading and some of my thoughts about it, but this is going to be a full spoiler conversation between the two of us. Mm -hmm. We've previously buddy read and held discussions on my channel before, but that's always been over like Zoom. So I'm so excited to actually have Stephanie here with me today mm -hmm. so we can talk about it in person. So exciting. So if you don't know, Crescent City, House of Earth and Blood is the first book in a planned trilogy by Sarah J. Mack who's also famous for writing the A Court of Thorns and Roses series and Throne of Glass series. This particular one is in urban fantasy following a young woman named Bryce and she is a half fae, half mortal girl living in this place called Crescent City as the title suggests and she works at an antique gallery dealing in some maybe not so legal stuff but it's a job and her best friend Danica is the alpha of a shifter pack of wolves and they sort of act as like the police unit of the city. In the very beginning of the book Bryce loses Danica in a really traumatic way and then we get a time jump and we're sort of following Bryce as she gets roped into the investigation of Danica's murder as other murders that hap happen in a similar fashion start to happen around the city and the Archangel, which is the governor mayor figure of the city named Micah, assigns Bryce to investigate this string of murders and also assigns this fallen angel named Hunt to work with her. So that's sort of the basic foundation of the story. That's kind of what you get in the premise when you read the flap of the book. We both, I think, had very similar thoughts in that the beginning was kind of Oof. overwhelming. <laughs> I've previously read Sarah J Mass in the past. Yeah. You have not, so yep. this was completely new for you. Absolutely a new ride for me. <laughs> Even though I've read Sarah J Maas in the past, this was like a very big departure from what she typically mm -hmm. does, especially where it's more of an urban fantasy setting, which she had to establish, I think, a lot more than yeah. you would in a traditional sort of fantasy story that is a little bit more familiar. She had a very unique sort of political structure. Mm -hmm. The world itself felt very hazy in the beginning. You, you knew yes. Bryce as you followed her and her connection with Danica being like best friends but the world beyond Crescent City was sort of frustratingly vague. <laughs> yeah I would say even the world within the city in the first bit. Mm -hmm. You get the map obviously at the beginning of the book and you are referencing it but it's still that first part especially it is even hard looking referencing to the map of like yeah. what does the city actually look like. Well and then there are all these houses within the city sort of these different she has a, a term for, like, all of the more supernatural types of um, people, because you have fae, you have angels, you have shifters. Every single creature you could possibly think of. <laughs> and they all fall under different types of houses. Actually, yeah. let's let's look at them real fast, because this, this one specifically references the House of Earth and Blood, which is the house that the shifters belong to. Uh, funny note, I did not even realize that there was a reference page to this until yeah, like right after. a third of the way through maybe. So here's our, our map of Crescent City, which is pretty small. And especially with the amount, like I would kind of, I would understand it a bit more if the story was really contained to Crescent City. But Sarah Day Mass from not. the get-go really mentions like the world outside of it. There's this whole other continent named Pangera that is like, there's this whole humans versus uh, veneer. I can't remember if it's veneer or Vermeer um thing happening so yeah right after the map we have the four houses of midgard which is the realm that crescent city is a part of you have the house of earth and blood which belongs to shifters humans which is ordinary animals and you have the house of sky and breath which the malachim which are angels belong to as well as fey elementals sprites and those blessed by solace along with some favored by luna and those are two different gods uh, then we have the House of Many Waters, where river spirits, m myrrh, water beasts, nymphs, kelpie, kelpies, nox, and others watched over by Oginus. And then the House of Flame and Shadow, which belongs to the demon, demon, uh, Nikai, I can't, Daemon Nikai? Daemon Nikai? They're like half demon. Um, reapers, wraiths, vampires, drakai, dragons, necromancers, and many wicked and unnamed things that even Erd herself cannot see. So... You have 
these different houses and like you said you didn't even realize that that was sort of like an so informational many guide. things well it's just especially so many books like that first those first few pages can be like here's what people have to say about Sarah J Maas or her other previous books. So I just blew past that before I realized that that was even there. Yeah. And in the previous story, she's dealt mostly with like Faye, but this story really involves several different types of sort of supernatural characters. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was a lot at first. It was a lot. And even like the structure within the city, as you said, was kind of confusing. You have these different representatives of the houses that are sort of on this council for the city. Um, But then it seems like this world is truly ruled by more of the angel figures. And then there's this sort of upper ruling, I think, class of five or six. I want to say five or six, but there's one seat that's missing. Yeah, because they died or something, which is like otherwise impossible to do but they're yeah. like the asteri asteri yeah. or something yeah and Maybe they're like i honestly like i picture them as like living stars because that's mm. kind of how they're described a little bit and they're like these all-powerful beings that rule this planet of midgard and then the archangels sort of serve right under them and they're like governors for different uh regions of the world <laughs> And then you have, like, the city heads and then everyone else. And then way at the bottom, there are humans. And a big part of this story is humans kind of rebelling against these more powerful beings Mm -hmm. uh, for equality, basically. Like, even though they don't have supernatural powers or lifespans, they're, like, we're important, too. Mm -hmm. And so rebellion is a really big theme of this book, um, both with the humans and then our sort of second main character hunt is a fallen angel in the sense that he was part of this rebellion against the asteri previously because he also believes that you know all beings are equal there shouldn't be these really like regimented power structures and hierarchies but that rebellion failed so now he's basically a slave to the system he was trying to overthrow so much so 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 I think he feels a lot of empathy for the human cause, but it's also, like, it's all happening kind of in the background, too. Yeah. And I think that's where the main series is sort of going to go mm-hmm. in further installments. But this book, really, the central driving narrative was, what the hell happened to Danica in her past? I just feel like a good tagline for reading this book is, what the hell happened? Yeah. Period. Yeah. Um, the world building and even the political structures, there's so much going on that you almost want an info dump because Mm -hmm. there was a point where I didn't even realize that there was like a separate hierarchy within angels as well because I was like, is every angel the same? And then it's like, no, no, Well, and their wings apparently, that's kind of implied that like the wider their wings, the like more pure they are. Which the colorism in that is a whole conversation to be had on it. I mean, that's obviously like mirroring sort of real life issues. Yeah. but... But, um, But no, there's definitely a lot happening with the world and with, the politics of it that it's it's hard if it's already starting off the book yeah if it's already kind of hazy to then try to start to figure that out there were certain elements especially with political alliances for example where by the time i figured it out i didn't really care as much because it took so long for me to grasp it well i think it helped having like after part one i was kind of like okay that is background stuff and it was easier, I think, for me to sort of build my understanding of the world as a whole because it was happening more in the background, where, again, the forefront of the story is Bryce trying to figure out how Danica's pack died, and then this also sort of romance with Hunt happening Mm -hmm. at the same time. So, like, that stuff was much more easy for me to follow and allowed, again, my understanding to slowly build up of the other things that I think will become more important in time. But again, I I do think that sort of central mystery of like, was Danica who Bryce thought she was, Mm -hmm. as well as what is powerful enough to destroy like one of the most powerful like shifter alphas Mm -hmm. in the realm and her pack. I, I wanted to know. Like, I I, yeah. I had a really hard time putting this book down because I was like, what the hell happened to Danica? Because <laughs> it's really mysterious. And, and I think I we've talked about this book previously, sort of mm-hmm. back and forth as we were reading it and then sort of decompressing afterwards. But um, I think Sarah J. Mass creates these characters that you really do, even though, like, the plot was kind of hazy or the world was hazy. 
the characters were very clear. Like, I had a very good sense of who these people were, and yeah. I enjoyed reading about them. And, you know, I think, again, this romance between Bryce and Hunt, like, they had very clear personalities, mm -hmm. and um, Hunt was kind of a standoffish jerk, and his first impression of Bryce was that she was, like, literally an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, that she was just, like, a careless party girl. And, you know, he had a good reason, I think, to think that initially, especially the first time they meet, she's drugged out of her mind after this, like, whole horrible thing just happened to her. People have died. People have died. And, she, yeah. It's a miracle that she didn't it, die. Yes. And it's a lot. So, um, but once he kind of realized that that was also sort of a front that Bryce was putting on to protect I herself was gonna say. after this huge loss she suffered, she's, like, scared to let people close again. Yeah. And... Watching them be able to get close, I think, despite that, was really fun. And we both had instances where we were like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> between the two yeah. of them. Going back to a point that you brought where a lot of the book is trying to figure out exactly who and how Danica was leading mm -hmm. up to her death. Um, bringing up the bit with Bryce as well, where it's like the projected image that everybody had of her yeah. and what she actually, how she actually is. I feel like overall it's a very clear theme throughout the book mm -hmm. as well because especially even with Hunt it's like you are known as like the most hardcore fallen angel of all yeah. time and getting and to see that it's really about subverting those expectations yeah so kind of everybody has those little bits as well yeah. which is really enjoyable I also thought it was an interesting experience reading with this with you yeah. my best friend where this best friendship yeah really takes oh. front and center <laughs> in this book like even more so than the relationship between yeah. Bryce and Hunt is the relationship between Bryce and Danica yeah and it, again like I can't even imagine losing you much no, less I don't in such a traumatic that. way and then having to deal with the fact that, like, did I even know my best friend at all mm. when they're not there to, like, talk about these things with yeah. you? And so, like, several things get brought up where Bryce is like, no, Danica wouldn't do that. Danica didn't know this person. Danica would never be involved with that. But there are these things that, like, prove that she was involved with that mm. or she, like, was doing things behind Bryce's back. And I think that's probably... It's so hard to grieve someone when you think you fully understand them and then to find out after they're gone that you may not have understood them as yeah. well as you think you did is like a whole other layer of grief. Because <laughs> like, who are you mourning if not the person you you knew? Yeah. And that was like a really big, like that hit me hard reading that is her consistent sort of like, you don't just get over it in two years yeah. and her having to you know, she has this moment where she's like, I feel like everyone's just moved on. Yeah. And like, how can I live my life the same? Like, in pretending like Danica was never here, she's got this huge hole in her life. Because yeah. not only was her best friend murdered, her best friend's pack, who was by extension was also her family. Bryce's sort of family, yeah. um, all in one fell sweep were gone. Oh, and yeah, so she's got this huge hole in her life. And, or even like, her like everybody else moving on and her wondering why is it everybody's moved on I don't understand and not just the mental anguish that that is but the physical anguish of that as well where she is in pain like physical pain this whole time yes, and she's she like this, I don't want to she has this take physical rid of reminder it. yeah because yeah, the night that Danica died she got scratched by this demon that perhaps killed the pack and this demon had um, actually it was bitten, I think. This de demon had, like, venom that, like, stayed in her leg and caused her pain for the next two years, yeah. and her, she didn't want to heal it because it was a reminder that Danica was there. Yeah. She's not gone, and I just think that was, like, even though these are supernatural beings and stuff, like, yeah. that was so relatable. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's hard to let go of even painful things. Mm -hmm. Um, when they remind you of someone that you loved who's no longer here and the fear yeah, of that forgetting things. The fear of, of forgetting memories yeah. of even just like sensory memories as well. Like you can relate to that really hard and I think a lot of us, especially within this last year and a half, can really relate to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I think again she has Sarah J. Mass is good at writing these like very real character moments that hit you hard, even though they're going through things that like would never Just happen could never possibly in real happen. life. <laughs> yeah, she's able to kind of bring it back and make it relatable. So yeah, the the friendship between Bryce and Danica was like really what made me the most emotional in mm -hmm. this book. And then at the end, we have this moment where Danica is gone, but like a piece of her remains. A very small piece. In um the the realm of the bones quarter. Yeah, there's like this part of the city that like when you die, you get kind of your remains get sent to. 
and then that's sort of if where your good. spirit lives if on. If not, your boat. Yeah, the like, bone quarters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. The House of Flame and Shadow. So yeah, there's this piece of Danica that still lives on, and at the very end of the book, a lot happens. <laughs> so much. The last 300 pages had me in a chokehold. I could not put this book down. And part of what happens at the end is Bryce is sort of appealing to the entire city. There's these gates where if you sort of sacrifice a drop of your power, you most people use it as like a way to make a wish these days, but you can communicate through the gates um, to other parts of the city. And the city is in ruins after a, you know, landslide Chaos. of events. Yeah. Chaos. And she sacrifices a drop of her power and appeals to the entire city. Like, if anyone is out there, please, like, help me. She's trying to go through this thing called the drop, which is a sort of... Um, like coming of age? Coming of age thing Into for, a mortality, Yeah, essentially. basically your physical body, your mortal body dies, and you sort of reach the depth of your power and then come back as an immortal being, or at least a, a, a being who is much harder to kill and will have a much longer lifespan. And Bryce held off on doing this because she was always... She always wanted to do it with Danica, but Danica unfortunately died before either of them had the opportunity to do so. But in order to basically save the city, Bryce, like, right then and there needs to make the drop. And so she's calling out to the entire city, like, can someone please help me? You have to have a physical anchor as you perform the drop to kind of help you come back to life, basically. It's a lot. No one answers. It's devastating. And she's like, well, okay. And then Danica from the Bone Gate calls out to Bryce and says, light it up, bitch. And I nearly burst into tears. It was so emotional. Just like, again, you know, if you think about like having lost your best friend, yeah. I think, you know, a lot of people cope with that differently. You know, you pray or certain things happen where you feel, you feel like a loved one's presence or whatever, but to have the actual like person that you are mourning reach out and be like, let's do this shit, <laughs> was yeah. just so emotional. <laughs> and where she was able to perform the drop and physically feel Danica's presence mm -hmm. was just like, oh my God, it hit me so hard. So again, I think despite the issues that this book had narratively, the character relationships were really strong. I feel like hearing your thoughts on the importance of best friends and that friendship in this book my views on the book are still relatively the same, <laughs> but I think it does make a stronger argument for enjoying the book. Yeah. Because, um, so, segueing into that, I feel like I enjoyed the book better than you did. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's, like, hard to describe. Yeah. I don't love the book. I don't hate the book. Mm -hmm. But it's, like, somewhere kind of in between. Yeah. Um, there was a you, lot that happened. I think I'm still so overwhelmed. so much. I mean, the fact, like, really... You already talked about it on your vlog where, like, this book is deceptively small for the amount it's, of that's content. It's 800 pages. It's, it's yeah. wild. It's yeah. wild. That's um, a Game of Thrones book. <laughs> and so reading it, it's like, one, there's a lot of stuff going on. The world building. It took me such a long time to be able to visualize what this world looked like. And mm -hmm. I feel like usually when I'm reading, that's pretty easy for yeah. me to do. So the fact that I was struggling so much in the beginning, um, the character building and the relationships really do help and save in my opinion the book mm -hmm. that last little bit and how things tied up together really made it so that I did enjoy the book enough because if it hadn't happened the way it did in the end I don't think I would have enjoyed yeah. it yeah yeah the ending I think was really strong like plot wise mm -hmm. and again character wise where like all these really big moments happen and you're just like yes yeah. <laughs> either yes or like you're flipping the page because you're like oh shit oh shit oh shit oh yeah. shit what's happening yeah um, cause we have at the very end, Lehaba, the fire sprite that Bryce works with the entire novel that you just like fall in love with. The cutest. Sacrificing herself to help Bryce. Bryce assassinating Micah. Oh, it was so good. Hunt assassinating the other archangel. Which I can't remember um, their name. I had it the other, the other day. But I feel like it also starts with an A. It starts with an S. Oh, just um, kidding. 
because I kept I kept mixing it up with Sabine, the the, mm. the other pack leader. So yeah, you, uh, you have Hunt assassinating the other archangel, and everyone in the room just like letting it happen. Yeah. <laughs> so you have like these big moments that were like there was a lot of build up to that, and it's so satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the beginning I thought even like past part one mm. was a little rough. And there were a lot of details that got introduced so often, and. Granted, that I think that most books will do that, but mm-hmm. there were so many things before that point where I could see a reader like myself reading through it and wondering, okay, this is a lot going on. Mm-hmm. Is this going to be a whole other thing? How yeah. does this relate? Is, should this be for this book or maybe another book? And getting to the ending, a lot of those things were those loose ties yeah. kind of tied up and everything, but it's still a struggle to like find myself enjoying the book past that. Yeah. Well, and I think an interesting point you brought up the other day, um, off camera, is that this, like, those sort of narrative, I don't want to say mistakes, but, like, the, the, the bumpiness of the beginning feels like a debut author's sort of issues, not someone who has two other full series under yes. her belt. And this, I will say, is her, uh, Sarah J. Mass's first step into, like, actual adult fantasy. Her other books, the Throne of Glass series, was YA fantasy, and A Court of Thorns and Roses sort of bridges. Did it start? It started more YA, but it definitely moved into more yeah. of, like, the new adult kind of category. But I think the world building, again, like, in YA fantasy, you have... You don't have as much world building, typically. Mm-hmm. It's familiar, and you can kind of just pick it up and go. Yeah. Whereas a lot of more adult fantasy or more epic fantasy has more of those sort of, like, layers to the world building. And I think it's really difficult to do that in a sophisticated way. So where this was sort of her first attempt at something a little bit more complex and nuanced, um, I can see why those steps weren't quite as smooth. Um, But yeah, I, I do agree that it, it had one of the rougher beginnings. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it was necessarily my favorite book by her. I do think the characters were really well developed, but um, but yeah. It does make me curious to see where the series is going to go, yeah. though. I'm definitely interested in picking up the second one. And I think knowing what I know now about the world, this would do well on a reread. Um, but you shouldn't have to have that prior <laughs> knowledge, obviously, when you're picking it up for the first time. Yeah. Um, but I think the beginning of the book would be a lot more interesting knowing what I know now. Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, I will stick to my point that a expanded world map would have... It did it not make sense to me. Yeah. It would have... I don't think it would have remedied every complaint that I have about world building, but it would have helped yeah. so much because the way that the map is set up and like just as much time as you're putting into writing the story, you're going to, I'm assuming, put as much time into developing that map that your reader is going to see. Even just having a little bit more of a reference of just how big this world actually is would have really helped with it. Yeah, because we hear a lot about this other continent, Pangera, where this rebellion of the humans is happening. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the really only other place you hear about, I think, is the Eternal City, which Mm -hmm. is where the Asteri, like, live. Mm -hmm. And then this sort of North Gate, like... You, t- you hear a lot about the Fae coming through mm-hmm. from the north. Yeah. From this other realm. But then there's, and like, also other islands where the Fae are. Well, because that's and where like, they settled. Yeah. Or that's or like, where some of them settled, yeah. Especially with just how many magical people there are in yeah. this. It's like, when you're first reading, it's like, oh, is it just the city? And then it's like, no, there's a much bigger there's world. There's a much and bigger like, world, yeah. I would have just appreciated even just a glance at what that would have looked yeah. like because I think it would have helped move the story along to the point that I didn't have to get 150 pages in to have mm-hmm. a more clear view of yeah. what this world would look like. One thing I thought that was a really interesting element that was really only hinted at by this sort of Prince of Hell figure. Um... Which also, Prince <laughs> of Hell, him being introduced was like, I think at the point that he was introduced, 
as I was reading, I was like, okay, I'm not really sure how I'm feeling. And as soon as he got introduced, I was like, now I'm more intrigued. That scene was cool. That was intense. Well, it was intense because Bryce is literally summoning a demon and Hunt is like, what the fuck are you doing? (laughs) They're like going to the Viper quarter and being like, "Hmm, should we get this thing that's absolutely illegal? It's like, oh, we're up to some nefarious. And that she actually planned to use it. Yeah. yeah, To summon a demon, much less a prince of hell who she's met before. They're like really chummy. Like what? Um, we've got literally hit we got hunt as umbra mortis like just yes. the badass that he is being like how do you know a prince of hell yeah like, Who that had whole previously scene. appeared to bryce as a fucking cat yes <laughs> um anyways i digress um he brought up some really like i am so interested to see where like he comes in more into the story because i think like you're right that element alone was so interesting i was like i want to know more about that and he brings up how you know previously our understanding i think of hell was literally like sort of the christian mindset of like hell like fire and brimstone a realm below our own and this prince of hell guy is like no it's just it's literally like another planet a different realm Mm -hmm. basically like off planet and and like this gate thing also a lot like it reminds me a bit of The Witcher, because I don't know if you're familiar much with the background, but, like, mm. the monsters that witchers hunt down all came to this one world during this event called the Conjunction of the Spheres, and mm. basically, like, all these realms kind of, like, crossed paths and, like, allowed these things to cross over mm. into their realm. Interesting. So, this kind of reminded me of that, because it feels like there's this sort of gate area or, like, this maybe thin point in their reality where other things can come through and their experience is mostly with demons but it seems like there's like More. that's where all of these magical yeah. creatures that live in this world came from i think they hinted that like the um the malachi the angel figures and the asteri are like the only actual native beings of the planet i didn't pick up on that at all um and that literally everyone else came from like a different world and especially the Fae, because they mentioned that a lot. Yeah. So. I feel like with the Fae, it was, like, a lot more clear. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting that, like, this Midgard world is basically just where a bunch of other people came from. And, like, they've all sort of mixed and you know what I created think this, this other think hierarchy of, of what? <laughs> um, as we're, like, describing the gates, I think the way that I, like, kind of envisioned it as I was reading, but, like, kind of came full force to my brain now is when you're in Treasure Planet watching the movie kind of, and like yeah. as the gates open, like yeah. that is kind of how my mind was envisioning how some of this works. So mm-hmm. having Hell described as like, no, this is just another place. Yeah. Really links up well with that. Hell, written the way it is throughout the book, drives me up a wall. Really? I just don't under, like we talked about this briefly when I first started reading. I think that's a pretty traditional sort of understanding of Hell though, like Dante's Inferno no, no, where there's different no, like, no, no, layers. No, 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 not that, not that. Oh, okay. The literal... Written oh, oh, H E L. It drives me. There's up a wall. No, it's it's from Norse mythology. I still don't like it, honestly. Uh, well, I this book I like think is that combines, actually yes? Because I the whole time I was just like, is this? Yeah, Hell is like the the goddess of death or something. I still don't. I mean, Midgard is also a Norse mythology thing as well. You have kind of these different mythologies coming together in this book. It did. It just. It, it irks feels me at like first. a lot. It irks me at first, but of of all of the little isms Sarah J. Mass has, that bothered me the least. I was much more annoyed by the male female thing coming up again in this book. Because if you've little, seen my Akatar vlogs, you know that drove me nuts. The little isms. Um, As a new reader, an alpha hole. Oh my god! <laughs> Instead of just saying asshole, she calls I, people alpha holes. As a person so who is cringy. new to reading Sarah J. Mass <laughs> and not really knowing that this is something she does, yeah, reading it and seeing it, maybe it's just the three years of law school that's really done it to my brain as well. <laughs> but those little differences, without it just being very clear, because at some point with alpha hole, for example, I was like. Is Sarah J. Mass just not going to use asshole? No, it was something at specific all? to Bryce. Oh no, I got that yeah. eventually, but I really they thought they didn't use asshole in other instances. But that's the thing. Like once I saw asshole written down, I was like, oh, so this is just like for me as a new reader, it was like, are you just trying to be edgy right now? Uh, no, alpha hole was like a word that Bryce specifically used to refer to males. 
males <laughs> who acted in a very dominant possessive way because she doesn't like that in a guy and the whole male like again Which as to much as the male female thing drives me insane it is her way of trying to like separate these people from humans because men and women are like human terms but then you'll have some of the characters who are not regular humans refer to themselves kind of in a way that makes you think that they're referring to themselves as human like i can't i feel like before Alehaba has her valiant sacrifice. I fucking love her. Also, like, talk, like I can't remember what it was, but there was one point where she was like, am I not a person as well? And I was well, like, person oh, is different, I, I think, in this world than human is. As a new reader, it, it makes it very confusing. Yeah. It is a matter of taste, for sure, with Sarah J. Mass. And for me, personally, it's something I don't love. I find it cringy, but... I enjoy it. Like, the stories are fun enough for me to, like, get past that. I will still read it. Yeah. But when it comes <laughs> to ultimately thinking how much I enjoyed the book, yeah, it marks, it takes it down points yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, and, like, I, that's, I don't think I've rated a single Sarah J. Mass book five stars. <laughs> I've had a lot of fun with Sarah J. Yeah. Mass. This year is the first time I've picked her up, and I've been really enjoying them, but they are not, like, I like a soup like they're not my favorite books but they're fun books and I think that's fine to pick up every now and then you know like not every book you pick up has to be the best book you've ever read and no for sure for sure <laughs> and these ones are definitely a lot of fun so sometimes when I need something just sort of like silly and like I, I also like her romances a lot and those are fun like that is what I will go to so um, she's not my favorite author by any means, but I've no. learned to look past some of her more annoying traits because I, her characters are so fun. I'm so relieved to hear that you can look past them. <laughs> um, I struggle. I struggle <laughs> with it. There's, it's just little things that depending on who your primary audience is for the book, sure, you may not care about as much for some readers like myself or others. That might be the thing that just, like, really Oh, no. Like, and I think that's totally out. valid. That's, yeah. That is enough, I think, for someone to DNF one of her books, for sure. I will She's continue. not for everybody. <laughs> like, I, I finished this book, I, as I said earlier. I am in a middle ground where I don't love it, but I don't hate it. I think it is telling that you, who normally read much faster than me, I was ahead of you for the majority the of the book. The first part took so long for me. Yeah. And granted, I... Where I think I was able... Because I was a little bit more used to Sarah J. Mass, I was able to sort of just kind of blast through that stuff I didn't just understand even... <laughs> in the faith that it would come later. <laughs> or just even, like, it's, you read significantly more fantasy than I do. Mm -hmm. So I think there were even certain elements where it was like, okay, I have to re-familiarize myself with what that is or what that looks like. But I feel like I'm a broken record at this point. But that world building, if it just, little refinements could have mm -hmm. made that go by so much more yes, easily. Yes, for sure. Or not even that it needs to go by quickly, but that me as the reader would be able to pick up on that yeah. more easily. Yeah, yeah. If you're picking up this book with no understanding of sort of Sarah J. Mass as a writer, I think there's definitely hurdles that yeah. she's putting new readers through in this book. So it's not for everybody. No. In the interest of having this video not be an hour long, I figure we should transition into some closing thoughts about this book perhaps yeah. as i've said i think i enjoyed this much more than you did um <laughs> given my i think background with sarah j mass and my expectations going in i didn't think that this was going to be like the best book of the year for yeah. me but i thought it would be a fun time and that's what i had i had a fun time was it amazing in some parts yeah again the end that ending had me in a chokehold um but yeah i don't know I, I had fun with it and i believe house of sky and breath the second one um, comes out in February of 2022, which is oh, only a couple really months away. By. Part of why I wanted to pick this up now is mm -hmm. that there wouldn't be like this really long wait because <laughs> I am impatient. But yeah, so I'm definitely going to be picking that up. What about you? I am still on the fence about it. Yeah. Again, I think the ending did mend a lot of things that I had issues with and mm -hmm. for me saved my opinion of the book. But I'm not sure if I would want... I'm not inclined to pick up more Sarah J. Mass at this point. So I'll never be able to get you to read Akatar. Ah, uh, you know, I don't... I'm not... I'm not super sold on it. That's fair. There are certain That's aspects... Fair. It's not for everybody. There are certain <laughs> aspects that I like of the book. And as we've said before, the characters and certain characters, I think, would make me want to know what happens. But where... Especially if it's going to be a series where I would be really excited 
like when we talked about um reading six crimson cranes yes and after reading that book i was like i want to read and get fabulous rest like all the books that she has not really feeling it with Sarah Jane Yeah, Moss. you don't want to go out and buy her backlist after reading yeah. this one. Okay. Like, if you That's read fair. it, if you read it and you tell me, like, no stuff and you should give it a chance, your opinion weighs very heavily for me. So, like, I will probably do that. But <laughs> <sighs> just... Definitely reservations about how the book was. And that's fair. I appreciate you going into this with an open mind. Yeah. Um, I didn't know what to expect either, so <laughs> I don't know if I would have actually recommended this to you like if I had read it first, <laughs> but I am glad we read it together, I think. I think your description at the beginning is the most succinct way to describe it because trying to describe this book while I was reading it to my coworker was like, I actually don't know how to describe this. And that could be really intriguing for some people, but for somebody, yeah. if it's in the same position as me, it's where intimidating. you're a new reader and maybe fantasy isn't even your like go-to genre, mm-hmm. it's a little rough. Yeah. But it was a fun time. It was wild. It was wild. Any final thoughts beyond that? Final thoughts. I mean, there's just, there's certain points where I'd be curious to think, or if I could, like, even if I could talk to Sarah J. Mass, I'd be like, who do you, do you think is your primary audience for this book? Because I think knowing that would make more sense as to stylistic decisions she sure. made. Ooh, one more thing. Sarah J. Mass, I've only read the Akatar series. I have not read Throne of Glass, but mm-hmm. apparently in both of those series, she sort of introduces a love interest and then, like, a different one comes later and then the first love interest is like an asshole <sighs> horrible person um so i've i've read some things about her like the fear that she's going to tamlin hunt do you think hunt is going to stay the main love interest cuz apparently this is something she's infamous for doing and i think if she did it three times in a row that'd be kind of insane and hunt did have like a mini betrayal in this one book which was but just they brought out of, it back it, it, it was, was out, out of character. nowhere. It was it out was. of character. It was. Honestly. No, those were the actions of man with nothing to lose, and he had a lot to so lose. So much to lose. Anyways. Um, I really hope not. I like Hunt overall. Because I think yeah. his character, like... And it suits Bryce well. Yes. And especially, like, as the relationship grew, it would be... It would be a lot. It would be devastating. Also, I if think it's if something... They... It, it would... Mm, if it's something that she's done before, to then do it again. Yeah. Like, sure. Authors will develop and create their style and do their thing. And, like, if that is the thing that they do, then I yeah. guess that makes sense. But to have an MO like that's like, that throughout annoying, all of yeah. them. Well, and part it of... Would, it would bother me, I think. It reminds me so much of her other character, Resand from the Akatar series, who is that second love interest yeah. and swoops in and saves Feyre and stuff. So, like, I think it would be weird to have someone who's so, like, similar to one of your other hero characters to be, like, a shit person. And, like, having other love interests pop up and, like, the conflict that that can bring is one thing. That's fine. But to but make your character, yeah. if you, like, put gave all this time... So that the reader can fall in love with them in yeah. the same way. It can be To then be like, just kidding. And my opinion would it. change. My she's opinion would it. absolutely change. Yep. So I am curious to see how... He's on the cover of the second one. So that's promising. Like, I don't think she's going to forget about him or like cast him aside. So yeah. so again, thank you so much for reading this book with me. I'm sorry it wasn't your favorite that we've ever read it's, together. But I think it was fun in its, its fun. own right. Yes. Um, And I very much enjoyed having this conversation with you. Yeah. And we've we've honestly been talking about this book for days now. Honestly, like over a week at this point. I know. We've just started kind of now having the time to sit down and record yeah. our thoughts. But it has been a very fun time talking about this book with you. But airing our grievances. I love our, I love our little BFF book club that we have going on. Continue continue yes you're allowed to choose the next book though i feel like i've choose, chosen the last few <laughs> well so. we'll think about it we'll okay think about it. yeah so thank you so much for being on the channel once again thank you for always having me it's a pleasure yes i love having my best friend on my channel so and thank you guys for yep. watching i know this has been kind of a long conversation but hopefully it was entertaining for people who have read the book maybe have your thoughts validated or challenged let me know down in the comments below if you've read this book, uh, Crescent City or Sarah J. Mass in general. What are your thoughts? How do you feel about the map? How do, yeah, or the lack thereof of a world <laughs> map. That was one of my biggest gripes. And are you excited for the next one? Because, again, as difficult as of, a ta- of a time as I had getting into this one, I am really excited to see where this story goes. And I think it has a lot of potential. So yes. I'm hoping it lives up to that. Her last series, um, A Court of Thorns and Roses, 
the second book is widely regarded to be the best. So maybe now that she's gotten some of the clunky world building stuff out of the way, there's gonna be a lot of room. But there could be more world building. There could be more. Yes. So thank you guys so much for watching and tuning in. Feel free to follow my socials down in the description box below. Like this video and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and have a lovely day. Bye.